here really to talk profitable personal training, right? So that's definitely all of our goals and I'm trigger happy. Sorry about that. Um, my goal for you is to share with you what I've learned being in the fitness industry for, for 28 years and have to admit that uh, back then there wasn't even personal training. So this is definitely a, uh, a learning experience as we were working with one-on-one -on -one and we started working in groups with people we were probably training before we knew it was training and it certainly wasn't the caliber that we have at this moment in time we weren't really doing a lot of personal work with anyone we were doing more of a everybody gets the same kind of a program even though possibly it's you know unique in one-on-one -on -one, we're doing a better job of teaching so we've come a long way, a long way. And what I know is I've learned a lot throughout that period of time. And like you in whatever capacity you're in, I was marketing all that time. Word of mouth, while you're teaching, while you're training, you are actually marketing. But I've narrowed down what it is we need to know and do into four different categories. And they are programming. So Determining what programs, packages, services you're going to deliver and how you're going to do it, how you're going to price them, and how you're going to position them. That is really your programming piece of it. And it, it has to come first. You've got to really start there. And so that is going to be the number one that we talk about. So we're counting from highest priority first to number 10 is important, but probably comes after you get this one down. Second category is marketing. So then it's taking those packages, programs, services, and wrapping them up into a package that a customer is willing to buy. That it's what they want and not necessarily what they need, but we're going to give them what they want. And hopefully once they get to us, we'll also be able to convince them what they need is even more valuable. From that, you got great programs, you've marketed it, you're going to get some questions. And the idea is that we convert those questions into sales. And the fourth thing, and don't tune out if you are a trainer working for yourself, but the fourth thing is leadership. So in whatever capacity you're working, you at some point hope that you have employees. Maybe you continue to work solo. You are still in a leadership capacity given we're all in thought leadership. It's a little bit dangerous in our industry to say only thought leadership, but you're influencing people's thinking about exercise and thinking about nutrition. And we still have a lot of work to do in our industry. It's, it's probably still even more accepted that someone has a few drinks or smokes or is a few pounds overweight than sometimes is very choosy and specific about the nutrition that they've got or um, that they go out of their way to eat well or take care of themselves. So we've still got work to do. And in that way, even if you don't have a team of employees, you still have leadership that you can work on to help yourself be that much more effective. So let's dive in here. Number one, the first major tip here is know who your client is. And this is one thing I would have to say. The majority of us, we are in a hurry. We like to move really fast. And there I am. I'm trigger happy again. Sorry about that. We like to move fast and we do a lot of things at once and we multitask. And that's probably many of us who are drawn to personal training are like that. The more we get done, the more efficient, the more effective that we are, or we think we are. And probably this is one area where you're going to have some resistance to this. And I'm going to suggest something that you will become much more effective as a personal trainer, as a business person in the fitness. If you can slow down and really take some time on this step, the rest of the pieces will fall together so much better. So I'm going to, this will be the first area where I actually ask you to stop and think for a second, but know who your client is. So you really need to know what's their problem, their goal, their gap, their gender, and their age. But before you can even do that, the reason to do it is you want to make sure you're delivering services that somebody wants to buy. 
biggest error that I've seen over the last two decades, really, as personal training has emerged, is we get excited behind the scenes about a new activity or we get excited about a new theme or a tool or a toy. And we want to offer that because we think that's cutting edge and that's what they want without really listening to what's what's being said in the locker room before class and after class. What are they saying? What are they saying at lunch when they talk to each other and really let down? What are they saying when they have girls night out about what it is that they want? Those types of things are really quite important and much more so than our own motivation for offering our expertise. So you really need to get an image. So if you're on Facebook, give me a yes in your question. You know, that's you're on Facebook or you're uh, on Twitter. You have your picture on your website. So if you're using a social media tool and you've got a picture, you've got an avatar, right? So Chris is a yes. You have a picture of yourself there for a reason, right? So your potential customers are are choosing you somewhat based on your looks, right? I mean, we can all agree that's a draw. It can be a an intimidation factor for some of our clients, for sure, or prospects. But that avatar tells them who you are. At least they get an impression or they make a judgment and they decide, oh, yep, you know, that's definitely somebody I, I want to, you know, associate with or, oh, no, you know, that's definitely not what I had in mind. It's kind of like your profile on Match.com if you were, you know, looking for a date. It's who do you want to date as your personal trainer? That's what people are doing. You, going the opposite direction, need to have in your head who is my avatar for any program that you're going to offer. You may do this multiple times in your marketing and your programming, but you want to go deep and do it one thing at a time. So if you've got a new program you're starting and you've probably got some kind of concept around it first, what you need to ask yourself is who's the image I have in mind? Is it a male or is it a female? And it might, it might appeal to both and don't feel you're backing yourself into a corner, but I want you to choose one because the deeper you can go and the more you can get one image and talk to quote unquote one person as you decide what should this be about, how am I going to put the words out there so this person gets them, what would they say about it, okay? So that's the idea. Think about what gender, what age is this person that is your ideal customer or client. Now think, what's their problem? What are they complaining of or what is their fear What's their goal and their biggest desire? So as you can answer those questions, then you have a much better idea of if you've got their goal and you know where they are now, how much of a gap is there and what has to happen in order to close that gap? Now that is going to be what you deliver. But the words that are going to really appeal to them are the ones about their problem. So we are twice motivated by our fears as we are by our desires or by pleasure two times as much so if you think about how you are marketing and advertising and what words you're using you we tend to maybe stray away from this because we want to stay in the positive we don't want to be a negative but it's not that you're going to say don't do something which is a negative that we we don't hear we we take the don't off the top and we say do. So it doesn't make sense to us as a marketing um, use of language. But you want to make sure that you use something that's an emotional word. So if you think about um, when somebody is middle-aged, middle-aged female about to go through menopause, just jot down a couple things. What are What are they complaining about? What do they dislike about where they're at right now? What are they complaining about in the locker room? You know it. You've heard it. So think on that for a second. Type in your answers there.
Okay, I'm not getting any responses. Am I still? Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. My body slowing. Okay. Body slowing down. Can't move like I used to. Can't lose weight. Yep, kind of at a stuck point. Great. And what are their hot words? Fat, cellulite, words that sometimes we avoid, right? Fat, cellulite, muffin top. So if you look at those three words, fat, cellulite, muffin top, which one's actually more emotional probably? Think on that for yourself and it, it may come at you differently than the next person. So that's okay, but the difference in those words, even though they reference the same thing, is gonna be very, very different. Fat is probably a really emotional word for a lot of people. So think about that in your marketing. You know, when we read books and the title is uh, Lose the Fat or 14 Days to Fat Loss, you know, using the F sound over and over again is a great tool. Those are the things that are going to really grab that person if that's their fear. So for a middle-aged woman, it also may be, you know, becoming less attractive not attracting her husband anymore or not being able to attract, you know, a mate if she happens to be single or divorced. That's also a big fear. Now you're getting to the underlying level of what's going on in somebody's head when they want to choose an exercise program. Their fear might be intimidation. That might be, I'm, I'm afraid of not being attractive and not being attractive to the opposite sex and being alone, but I'm also afraid of coming into an atmosphere or environment where I feel very, you know, out of my comfort zone. So those types of things will be where your best words come from. Now you can really create a program that addresses those types of clients very specifically. So you may offer something that's a, a boot camp in the morning. Think about really, even if you have 50 people that you'd love to come to that, think about one person when you do your marketing and write with that avatar in mind, even go as far as naming it. You know, is it Sally? Is it Gertrude? Is it Ruth? And that was terrible. That's my mother's name. Okay, we're going to skip that one. We're going to go on to the next one, piggybacking on it. So the first one, number one tip, came from programming, from that category. This one comes from marketing, obviously, keyed up by the word. So market the message optimally. So we've got to figure out a way with all of the tools we have at our hands, at our fingertips now, where's the most effective use of time and energy and sometimes money, right? Do you actually go for social media with Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest is now jumping on there, YouTube, or do we, you know, go traditional route, creating flyers, getting them out into business, kind of guerrilla marketing or grassroots? Do we go by newspaper? A lot of people will say any more no to that. Um, radio, what works in your market may be very different, but the fact is we have too many choices. And generally, what do our clients do when they have too many choices? You know, they really don't exercise very effectively at all, right? They just don't know what to choose. So they do very little. So here's a tip. Social media has a really low conversion rate, particularly Facebook. So I know a lot of people will try to get, you know, likes and you know, Facebook ads. And if, if all you're doing in that is putting, you know, like my Facebook page to stay in the loop and it's on there and then you leave it alone, that's great. Not a problem. It's not a time issue for you. It's not doing any harm, certainly. But I wouldn't spend a lot of time or money on your Facebook advertising for likes because you don't want just friends. You want paying customers. You don't want fans. You want, again, paying customers. And the conversion rate from people who are there who then come over to buy from you is really low traditionally across every industry. So think about that. 
it's probably a better place for you to communicate with current clients. Send them there and say, I'll post updates on new things and let them stay in the loop and create community for you. But the one exception to this rule is YouTube. And the reason being is that this is what you do. So this is putting you in your element and letting you show you to your customers in a non-intimidating way where they can see you in action, see what you do, see how you interact with your clients when you're in a session with them, whether it's a group or a boot camp or one-on-one. -on -one. But you've got to do it with a lot of conscious thinking. So this is one tip here. We're going to go deep in this one because this is one that can really help set you apart from other people and get you rankings in Google that go a long ways toward establishing you as the credible expert in your area. So how you play matters, okay? Pun intended. When you're doing your YouTube video, so what's the reason for it? We're laying down that foundation first. So not just why a trainer, you don't want someone to be thinking that's the question or that's the answer you're giving, but why you? Why is it you that stands out, what's unique and what's different about you? That's what you want to show. So if you personally can't answer that question, the customer prospective customer watching you won't be able to. So make sure that you can answer that first and then think about how can I relay that in my message? So if you are the most qualified trainer in your area, you've got more expertise in, you know, knee injuries or back injuries or um, athletics or running endurance activities, show that on your YouTube videos and write it in your descriptions. So take advantage of the length of the title of your YouTube video should have some really key words in it that refer to, let's say you're doing a prevent back pain kind of a course or training and you're showing that, put in there something about prevent back pain in women who sit at a desk all day. Use the length of it and keywords that someone might use to search for when they're looking for exactly your video and, and it would be a great hit. So think through that a little bit and then in your description, do the same thing. You know, trainer, you know, Tom is demonstrating here what to do and what muscle groups and go through it and use as much of that description as you can. So they give you a lot of word and character count in it. If you can take advantage of it, then the words that are repeated that you select in your search help Google find you when somebody's searching for that. And that can really elevate you. So show personal attention when you're doing your, your YouTube video. One of the things I've seen just as airs where you miss, you've got a great video. It's good enough. The lighting doesn't matter a whole lot. You know, the action is really important. The energy is really important, but you need to go deep with show personal attention. So show you looking at modifications, show you getting in somebody's face and really motivating them. You know, and if your style is, you know, really boot camp sergeant and that's you and that's what works for you, go for that, you know, show it. So really be who you are with your clients. And if that's not you, show that, show the piece that is, because you want this to attract the kind of people you're going to love working with. So get in there and do it and really teach don't demonstrate it yourself if you can help it. Get the neighbor, you know, to come over and be your guinea pig in it so it really shows interaction. And if you didn't practice with them and they don't know what's coming, even better. They don't need to be practiced. You do. Show how much you encourage. So your smile. So reduce the intimidation factor for anybody who's watching that. And that's who is watching it, by the way. The people who would be intimidated first to call you on the phone and come in are going to be watching videos. Grandma is on Facebook. Grandma's going to be on YouTube. Um, I became Facebook friends with a friend of my mother's the other day. She's 87 years old. She's on Facebook. 
So, I mean, that's the future. That's what's coming. People are going to use it and they're going to research before they actually connect and call you. So if anybody else could do the same exact video that you post, if there's nothing unique that points to you, you haven't distinguished yourself quite enough. So make sure that you look at all of your videos that you've got right now and say, okay, how could I have made that better? And just start tweaking. So don't eliminate the ones you've got, but make sure that you're doing better and more specifically pointing to you in the future. The last point on this, can't say enough. So get acquainted with your editing options. So I don't know what you're using and I have very limited access. I know now I'm on a Mac and iMovie is excellent. And I promise you, if I can do it, you can do it. But it's it's a great built-in editing service. So it loads up and you can select words. You can do almost anything you would need to do to load it up to Vimeo or to YouTube and post it, but you can put words in it. You And you wanna do that, right? You wanna give it a little text in between. Tell them what you're doing. Give that, uh, make it like a movie trailer. And that's built in. All you have to do is choose the slides and the little clips that you want. And, and it's right there. So take advantage of all the tools that are available to you and you're going to have much higher quality video. So planning it looks like this. Think about what's your purpose and your objective. When somebody watches your video, what do you want them to take away from it? I mean, you may just want to show this is who we are. And don't be afraid also to go on and just get someone to hold the camera and do a hello. This is who I am. This is my experience. This is, you know, a case study, show a testimonial to, um, of your clients in it. So that's also an idea. You don't have to do exercise, but stage it, plan it, be essentially a producer for yourself. And the other thing for quality level, vary the shot. So you almost do need somebody else doing this. It's labor intensive if you do it yourself, but it can be done. So do a close up. Show yourself the whole body shot and then come in and show what your knee over your ankle angle is supposed to be. You know, if you're doing a lunge or a squat and then zoom back out, it makes for a more interesting video and people will watch longer and be more attracted to it. So it's like looking at how long do people stay on a page in your website before they leave. People will watch those videos if they have more visual interest in them. Add a little music just as background. Try a voiceover. So again, that's something that you can use iMovie on a Mac. It's just a part of the program that comes on a, a MacBook Pro um, or an Air Mac, for instance, if you're using an Apple product. And I am not tied to Apple, by the way. Um, okay, so test your visibility. The last time, you know, you're going to put into a uh, post at the bottom of your YouTube video, for instance, you could just do this for the next five videos you post, put them on your Facebook page and put an ad in the bottom. First five callers, you know, you get a bonus with your registration in bootcamp just to see how much visibility you increased by adding those descriptions or, you know, making sure that you're really using the full length of your title. And that might be eye opening to you how much small tweaks can increase the benefit to you of visibility. Here's what the flow looks like. Everything starts with YouTube. So YouTube is kind of a connected to Google brainchild, right? So in Google, we trust is kind of the word on the street. So if you can start with YouTube video, it gives you so much longevity and then there's really, it's there forever, but you can post that on your website, depending on the quality of your website and what you've already got there. You may want limited number of videos, just change it out. So it's a fresh face rather than loading a page so that it's too slow to load for someone first time to your site. They may not be patient enough to wait. And I've experienced that myself. If you're using a scheduling system, if you're in a club situation and maybe you're using MindBody or 
numerous others that are out there. And that's not a promotion either. It's just the one I'm most familiar with. There's a way to put that in your scheduling system. And if you don't have that right now, just, you know, ignore that one. But then down to the bottom, you're back to your social media sites. And they're kind of all in the same level. A lot of times, if you are having your social sites communicate with each other, if you from YouTube or connected to Twitter, it will then go to your Facebook. But you do need to make the effort to link some things up, put them in LinkedIn, probably a different community to you, maybe more business people, more corporate sites if you're going that route. And when you do that, think about what kind of a video you want there as opposed to somewhere else. You may want yourself in a, a suit, you know, in a jacket, doing a lunch and learn talk or clips from a couple of them in your LinkedIn video, talking about fitness or talking about nutrition, and then promote that to that group if that's a service that you want to do. So make it really useful to you. And then you've got some really low cost advertising and marketing that's going to live long out there for you. Third tip here, you're always selling so everything that you do should point to a sale. So I just commented back there on the YouTube type video in the description, how you can make that somewhat of a sale. It's going to be a call to action. If you say the first five callers, you've said something about scarcity and that, you know, you're looking at this, I'm going to give you a bonus if you come to me. So a little reciprocity, that's, in effect, a sale, very low level. You've put it out there and, you know, they can act on it or not act on it, but everything should point to some kind of a sale. And you want to make sure that you're never thinking it's just a flyer or it's just an e-letter. It's never just a postcard. Think of a way that you can make that a sale. If you're sending somebody a motivational note, um, congratulations on that first 10 pounds. You're on your way. Your habits are changing. And then at the bottom, PS, don't forget, you know, this next month, you know, we're going to have a sale or we're going to have a bonus. Don't want to miss that. Just a reminder and leave it more as a tagline. It's not big, but those types of, you know, plant the seed, let somebody know, of a little extra. So there's always a way that you're trying to reach someone with a new promotion. So make sure that you're keeping that top of your mind. So an e-letter that I just got very recently for August. So we're, we're still fairly new into it basically listed all of the things that will be starting with school starts. So for you, that may be September, depending on your geographical area and when school start is, but you want to make sure that there is a call to action and a reason to read the newsletter. And it's not just maybe August newsletter. You're going to actually send something now that's seasonally, humorous or seasonally shocking that talks about, you know, the great pumpkin toss, you know, the next best workout. I think that was Sherry McMillan's um, headline title for a subject line in one of her e-letters. And it gets the most response because it's quirky and it's different. It's not similar or same as everyone else's. It's unexpected. And that really is, you know, what it is that you want to do is make sure you're not the same as everyone else. You're going to be unique and memorable. And even if they are shaking their head, they're talking about you and thinking about you. It's a good thing. So think about inserting these types of things, include a call to action. So a call to action would be click here. You have to, by the way, tell them exactly what it is that you want them to do. It may feel like you're spoon feeding them. And a lot of times if you read a really good landing page, meaning a website page that's driving you to a specific group session or offering a specific personal training package, 
you'll read a call to action about four times on the page. It will say, click here to get started now. Down below, it will say, click here if you're ready to start. Down below, it will say, and the reason is people just may not be ready at the same time. Someone who knows they wanted that and they were looking for it may click the first one. Somebody else may have to read down the page a little bit to get to know you and what the actual product or package is before they're ready to go, but include lots of different options for the speed that people interact with you or want to. Include a sense of urgency. So what is that? A limited time offer expires tonight at midnight. You know, this is just for you or five more spots left is a sense of scarcity. It's not going to be here forever. And there are ways that you can combine all of those. But those types of things are really kind of psychological triggers for purchasing. And it's used in every industry across the board. If you now have heightened awareness of it, you'll read through a magazine tomorrow with different eyes. But don't forget to do that in your own website in your flyers, in your newsletters, in your texts, your social media, anything that you're doing. The fourth tip is systemize. And this one is so big and so obvious, but so often overlooked. So oftentimes you're doing similar things day in and day out or seasonally or quarterly, but we kind of reinvent the wheel every time we do it. So if you've got those things that you know, I do this again and again and again, I come back to creating different types of programs over and over again, they should be systems so that if not now, at some point in the future, you could hand that task off to someone else and delegate. So it's going to be very easy for you to maybe hire an intern. And when I say hire an intern, I mean, for free. So <laughs> you're going to give them experience and they are simply going to um, get a lot of knowledge and a lot of your time and energy, but they're going to also give to you something that someone who was employed was. So you will much more easily be able to train them, turn it over to them, and then decide, you know, what benchmarks are there and whether or not they're doing it well, if you've got a system. So perfect example is go back to the very first tip we talked about, which was who's your client. So you could actually create just a template for yourself that says, you know, who's my client? How old are they? What gender? What's their biggest fear? What's their biggest goal or desire? Where are they now and what's the gap? How big is the gap? What's the time frame it's going to take them to their goal? How long have they been thinking about it? So if you can really get inside of the head of all of your potential clients for your boot camp in the morning, for your noon lunch and learns, for your one-on-one -on -one sessions, for someone you're advertising for running program, each time you're going to create a new package or a new service, that you want to singly advertise or uniquely advertise, you want to go through that kind of a system because that will help you create copy that gets to them. Here's where your red flag should come out. If anything that you're offering now, if I said to you, who's your ideal client for that? Who should come to that? If you can say anybody or everybody, what probably is happening is you're getting nobody that you're not very unique or you're not branding yourself. And here's the risk. We all think if I do that, I won't have enough customers. I'm going to limit myself if I narrow myself. So we try to wear all kinds of hats, but the truth is now and in the future going forward, it's even more going to be true that the more deep you can go in one niche, it's not that you will say no or that you won't serve somebody else, but you will really become known as the expert in one solid area. And if you drill down really deep and you take care of that one, then you can go to the next one. But instead, what we kind of do is 
build little rabbit holes here and there and everywhere, and they're not very deep, and we never really thrive and have a lot of profit in one of them. We try to create so many things that we can't really focus on that one unique that we could get really great at being an expert and being really credible and known for, and that's what you're looking for, for your unique piece. So as you work on systems and creating them, that will be another way that you set your business apart. And you can certainly buy someone else's system, but some of it is just needing to be you. This is one example. So if you do have employees or you think you might, and you could also put in here new intern hire system, and it's meant to show you not really hiring, but how would you write out the steps that were involved in it? So here's what has to happen. We need to have a letter of application from them that will trigger a packet. We're going to have them pick up that will trigger. They're going to return it and show us what their observations were. They're going to schedule trainer demos with two of my staff members and then one with me, and then they have to request an interview. So those are things that have to happen. Next is if they are still in the loop, we're going to do a references check. Next, if they make it that far, we'll finally do an interview. The rest of it has just been kind of them observing, interacting with our trainers, you know, and then last week they're making an offer or we don't. So if you can systemize that order, then you can go back and say, okay, what has to happen? So at the letter of application, that's going to get turned into the front desk or that's going to get mailed to me. And then the packet pickup, what has to be in there? Some forms they need to fill out. You may need to create those or collect them all in one place. A letter that explains these are your responsibilities. And so it gets you organized and then you can just prepare that. Oh, I've got a letter of application, you know, and if I want to accept that and go forward with it, here's what we're going to do. One, two, three, and you've got that all done. You don't have to think about it or wonder. You can just look at my list and check off those steps as you go through it. Much less hassle in having to think about it all over again. Number five. All right. Know what makes you different, better, unique. You want to brand it? You want to tag it? So think about the answers to this question. When somebody is thinking they need help with exercise. So they've come to you. Why you? So if you work solo, you are your business, but it's a why you. If you work in a club or multiple clubs, why your club? You need to know the answers to both of those questions. So you're prepared to answer it for them. Because if you don't know, you don't feel it, you don't project it, they are not going to know. And what you could be doing is setting up a sale for the next trainer that they talk to. People shop around. And if all things considered are the same, you have about the same years of experience, you have about the same certification as, as the trainer next to you, it's probably going to be the one whose immediate proximity is there at the moment they decide, okay, well, I'm going to do it. So what will make them choose you? If all else is the same, your years of experience and your credibility is the same, you need to be able to discuss your unique talents and gifts. So this is when you have to get good at boasting about yourself a little bit. So what is it that you can do for someone? You know, if you have a unique gift of, I can see what's really bothering you. I can see when you need to be pushed and taken to the edge, and you have more to give than you actually want to give me. That's my gift, or I know when to hold you back. Likewise, if you try to push yourself too hard, those little things I would encourage you to think about, because those will really be your selling point. And I want to focus just for a moment on baby boomers. So that may not be your key target market, but it will be an opportunity for everyone who's in fitness almost universally going forward and tell about 2050, the 
um, infertility has been an issue in the recent past. So there are fewer younger populations and the baby boomers in the United States and somewhat around the world, it's also a factor. They're going to be an evergreen market for all of us. So if they are specifically someone you want to work with, you can really niche this with this fifth tip here because they want to know it. They just want you to be honest and open and problem solve for them. And they will very likely buy from you if you can do that. Just let them know it and speak in terms that make sense. So in benefits, not in features. So a lot of times we talk about, you know, offered by certified personal trainers. Well, at this point, there are, you know, in membership in IDEA, for instance, there are about 251,000 personal trainers, right? And that's the ones we know about. There's many more than that. So if we say certified personal trainers, that doesn't mean a lot because there's another one down the street, around the corner, next door. What else? So what can you do that someone can't? So rather than saying faster, more effective weight loss, uh, or do say faster, more effective weight loss, sorry, instead of not the only certified nutritionist in the Moline area, for instance, or seeing energy and radiance younger next year. So obviously that's a baby boomer attraction right there, not food and exercise programming. So what you're wanting to think about here with the bolded options that are much better kinds of marketing term is that those are the things people say they want. You know, I wish I could exercise less and still get really good results. You know, I, you know, there's nothing at the time that I need it, you know, and there's nothing close to my house. So state your marketing term or your branding unique niche in terms that people are talking about wanting, you know, so if you say at our new urban location or now at downtown, that's really about you as opposed to them. So you might be saying the same thing here with convenient times and locations and with urban location, but it doesn't come across that way. It comes across as really for them and in, in, with the intention of taking care of them in one way and misses in the other. Number six is measuring and tracking. So how many times do we do this for our clients? All the time, right? We measure, we weigh, we take body composition. We may look at speed depending on their goals, but we forget to do that in our business very often. So if you are posting on Facebook, you might look at, and this is one where we probably do that, right? Cause we're all concerned about friends and getting liked it. How much response does a post get? track, you know, what's the difference in the words that you use or the questions and the action interaction that you encourage, see what results you get. But likewise, do the same thing with a certain kind of package. You know, what's the longevity of a certain client? So of my female clients who are 30 to 50, what's their average lifespan and purchase power with me? How much have they spent with me? And how many weeks or months or years have they stayed with me on average? And you'll learn a lot about your business. If you do that with every single one of your clients over, say, the last year, the last two years, you'll see who your niche is. It may show up to you if you really haven't selected it. It may have self-selected you. People who gravitate toward you, who want to work with you, that may be the direction that you should be going but know exactly what your bottom line is. And I'll give you an idea for most of us. Bottom line is money, right? We want to measure money as one way to know we've done a lot of good and not only for them, but for us. So you're going to need to look at how do you make more sales then, right? So what activities do you do that have to happen before you can make the sale? Many of us, that's a complimentary session. So we're booking a free session in order to let them establish some rapport and see what it's all about and realize, you know, I'm not going to scare you away or shout in your face or, or maybe you are if that's your style. But 
you want to let them know it and that's what has to happen. So you have to book more appointments, first of all, right? In order to do that, you have to back out. You have to make more phone calls. So how are you going to really get all of the appointments you need? The majority of us don't have people, you know, trying to call into us unless maybe you've done some leads. You gave a speech and you gave everybody a, a ticket that said call before Thursday for your complimentary appointment. So that's a great idea, a great reason people might contact you. Um, make more quality calls. So we lose focus because we are multitasking. And remember when we started doing things really fast. So if you can decide, I'm going to make my phone calls here in this 11 to noon time slot. I'm going to close my door. I'm going to make sure all my other windows in my computer are closed except for how I schedule my appointments. And I'm just going to focus on this and go down the line and one, two, and three, four, make my calls and maybe you get it done sooner. But the, the idea is you're not multitasking. You're really focused on it. You put your hat on first and think, what do I want the objective of this phone call to be is to result in an appointment. Who do I need to be? What do I need to listen for in the client? You know, so think about that. And if you're working in a club, the very bottom one here is making more approaches on the floor. Seven, I want to make sure we got through these. Name is everything and clear trumps cute. Think about the programs you have going on now, the group programs, or if you name your packages, you might also think about your business name, although that's a major change. And I realize that, you know, and we can't get, pardon my words here, but we can't get constipated about our titles too much, specifically your business name. If it's out there, it's already out there. But do think about programs that you going forward offer a name. So let's think about this just as a little marketing makeover. Okay, so before programs called Get Fierce. So, I mean, mentally right now, and write this down, jot it down into your questions and submit it to me if you can do that. Tell me what, what does that mean to you? What would you picture who that's for? It's for what gender, what age, what's the ultimate goal? If you have no idea, right? I have no idea. Okay, hard to tell. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And that is exactly the point. So here's, here's what it was advertising. In reality, it was advertising um, an early morning boot camp targeted at females, kind of young moms who either before work or while, you know, spouse was at home taking care of young kids so they could still get out of the house and get back again in plenty of time. So the before is get fierce. So it's cute. Maybe it's clever. Maybe it was meant to be a martial arts type of a, a class or activity, but much more clear would be early bird boot camp or booty camp. So the booty kind of suggests females more than males. Maybe, maybe not, but early bird certainly says morning. So kind of suggests this is before work. I can get it done, get it out much more clear. Next is bulletproof, excuse me, bulletproof boot camp. What is that? I'm not sure, right? I, I still don't know. So, you know, you've got to think about what's, what's going on here is, um, that's probably meant to be about strength, maybe about being injury proof, but it really makes the customer or consumer who's looking at that think, right? I mean, it, and how long is somebody going to stand and think about your flyer and then really get interested? It's, it's already too much work. I've got to ask about what it is. It's probably not going to be right on that point. So, you know, body weight training at fast paced intervals, that clearly is not clever, right? That clearly is blunt. 
but it gets the message across. And if you're trying to attract somebody who's looking for, you know, yeah, I don't want to bulk up, you know, and I want that idea of fast paced intervals because that's kind of all the rage right now, then it's clear. And so which one of those is probably going to be more full? You know, I would guess the one on the right. TNT, also very cute, kind of blasting and you know, that whole concept. But again, if you actually write it out, tone tough spots or whatever the verbiage might be, probably even more effective. Core classic, you know, butts and guts, pretty blunt. Remember we talked about emotional words? You know, butts and guts, probably the first more than the latter, is an emotional word. I mean, people of all ages. And, and I'll tell you that working with people who, who have cancer and are recovering from it, who have, you know, injuries or fibromyalgia or osteoporosis, you know, those probably are not the things that actually get them walking in the door as much as, you know, butts and guts would. And vanity is still a big motivator, no matter where we are. The eighth one and the obvious one is ask customers what they want. If you're not doing that right now, go out and ask them. Go out and ask your prior clients, what was it that really drew you to me? You know, I'm really trying to grow my business and be bluntly honest and transparent. And I'll tell you what I've witnessed is I am, you know, coming from a history of, you know, being a youngest child and really independent and an introvert to recharge my batteries. And that's hard for me is to go and ask for help. But the more I've done this and the more I've gotten out of my comfort zone to go and ask people, you know, I could really use your help and tell me the truth. I can take it. You know, what, what did you appreciate and what did you want more of? Tell me what you felt I was good at. Why did you come to me? They will tell you. And then they are telling you what they're willing to buy what's valuable to them and they may actually just name your next program and that's about all it takes we we get all tripped up in marketing and advertising and it's really very simple listen to your customers or prospects ask more questions and then listen again if you're thinking you're not really good at sales the only difference between somebody who's really good and profitable at sales is they ask better questions. And when I'm talking about asking better questions, the, the number one question is, how do you want to take care of that? <laughs> MasterCard, Visa, American Express, or Discover. But before that, before actually asking for the sale, asking kind of motivated questions about their motives for getting involved, asking them, you know, do you have a plan to do that? Asking them, you know, what is your plan? How can I be of assistance in helping you get to that? And just being a solution provider for them because you've listened. And the last and the 10th tip here is don't discount. And within the last 24 hours, I'll tell you where I saw this. And you think about how does it sit with you when you see something like this? I ran across a program offered on the internet that was in a long kind of landing page, web page letter. And it said the program started at $297 and there was a line, you know, through it on purpose discounted to $99. There was another line through that and now only $19. I mean, that for me kind of said run. <laughs> I mean, I think you've got to put out things that make sense. And that to a customer, I think comes across as, mm, I don't know, used car salesman possibly. So think about what message you want to send and what value it's got for you. So certainly if you're working one-on-one -on -one with someone, I mean, that's not a kind of a package or a discount that you can make your time very valuable for. And so value what your services are. It's probably a downfall of more trainers than not, is that we enjoy and we love and we're passionate about what we do so much that we sometimes have a harder time selling it as such and saying, you know, 
this is extremely valuable, not just to me, but to them. And this is my time. I can't give it away. And try to set your rates at a place that are a little bit higher than you think is reasonable and be the exclusive, be the unique, be the brand and, and not the commodity. And you will probably do better and have maybe fewer clients, but who are paying you a little bit more. So by doing something like adding value, if someone buys a large package from you, what could you give them to sweeten the deal? You know, can you give them a, a grocery store tour on top of that? And maybe it's built into your price from your side of the fence, but they don't know that. So you can give that to them and that's extremely valuable, right? Because of the longevity of it, the length of time that's going to add value is forever after that, once they've learned it. Give them value, give them a bonus, incentivize them, meaning if they refer someone to you, you give them both something. And that's a win-win for you because it costs like eight times the same amount to keep someone as to get someone in new. It's eight more times expensive in terms of the marketing and the time and the energy that it costs you to get a new person as opposed to keep an older person or a prior, older is not a good term right here. We know exactly how to do that with some of the language. And so I can definitely show you if you're local and if you're not, this is um, probably just a lead. And I've got some videos I am gonna send out posts just as a thanks for you coming and want to make sure if you've got any more questions, feel free to send them, submit them right now if you'd like to, and otherwise um, follow up with me via email, and I will be glad to share those with you. If you're able to attend a live event, we're going to do one early October. It's on the Iowa State campus in Ames, Iowa. We're going to take each one of these topics and subject areas and go a little bit deeper into that with profitable personal training systems. And you will leave that six hour workshop as, as if you are already preparing for your late fall and for sure your January events. So the link at the bottom is down there to register and it will follow up with each of you with the recording for the live webinar here and a series of videos as my thanks for your attendance. Anybody has any question, I'll take a few and and then we'll wrap up. Someone did ask a question about what iMovie was and whether it was a website. It's actually a program within uh, an Apple product. It's um, similar to like Word that comes automatically loaded onto a PC. So iMovie is just a uh, place where you can load up movies um, and create some real cool um, with very low tech skills, ways to modify your videos either for family or for business.